Hello and welcome to Holland Estates. You're listening to episode number 662. It's September 2021. I'm Paul Trudell. And I'm Juanita Valencia. Uh, how are you doing today, Paul? Very well, Juanita. How are you doing? I'm good too, thank you. Excited to speak to you about this case. Yes, so you picked a great case for us to, to discuss today. It's a BC Court of Appeal decision of Green Light Solutions Corp. B. Baker, and it deals with the uh, trusts and trustees and the liability of trustees and whether a person is actually a trustee. Um, it was uh, the amount in issue was not that significant, but the decision is, and I think it's an important one and it's very, uh, it's a very good expose on the role of the trustee and how one becomes a trustee. So perhaps you can tell us a bit about the, the background or the fact situation that led to the uh, decision. Sure. Um, so in May 2019, a company called Inismat Lynx Inc., which I will refer to as Lynx moving forward, agreed to loan Greenlight Solutions Corporation three million U.S. dollars, and under their agreement, Greenlight Corporation was to pay thirty thousand a thirty thousand deposit uh, to Lynx's lawyer. Uh, his name is Mr. Gordon Baker. So under the agreement, this payment was to be paid to Mr. Baker's trust account. And based on certain conditions, if some conditions were met, the amount was to be applied towards insurance costs. And if the conditions were not met, the deposit was to be refundable. Ultimately, the conditions were not met and Greenlight sought the return of the deposit. But, but at that point, Mr. Baker had already transferred the funds into two accounts on Lynx's instructions. And as a result, in September of 2019, Greenlight brought a claim against Lynx and also against Mr. Baker personally for breach of trust. Right. Yes. So, yeah. So the claim against uh, Mr. Baker, well, the claim against Lynx, the lender, they're the ones who actually received the money. Uh, they didn't defend the claim and the default judgment was obtained against them. Um, it appears that there was a collection issue or I'm not sure what the issue was, but the uh, where Greenlight continued the action against Gordon Baker, the lawyer who had received the funds. Um, and the allegation was that he held those funds or received those funds in trust and he had breached the terms of the trust by not returning the money to the borrower. Uh, the question that the court had to grapple with is whether Mr. Baker in receiving those funds was a trustee and held those funds in trust and had to abide by the terms of the trust. In the court below, the Court of Appeal in BC, the court found that Mr. Baker was a trustee and was liable for the return of the, the, the payment of the funds. The Court of Appeal, however, reconsidered the issue and looked closely at the law of trust and found that Mr. Baker was not a trustee and therefore wasn't liable. So maybe we can talk a bit about the basis upon which one can become a trustee or be deemed to be a trustee, because that was the, the fundamental issue in the Greenlight decision is whether Mr. Baker was a trustee when he held those funds. Oh, maybe just before we go into that, maybe we can talk a bit more about some of the underlying facts. The funds were advanced to Mr. Baker as Lynx's lawyer. Uh, there was wire transfer that just showed that monies were paid into his account. It didn't uh, indicate that they were trust funds. He was never provided with a copy of the agreement, um, the, the loan agreement that had the terms of the uh, trust or dealt with the transfer of this $30,000. He was never provided with that information. He never had any contact with uh, Greenlight. They weren't his client. He wasn't involved in the drafting of the, uh, the loan agreements in any way. Um, he just received the funds. I think the evidence was that he asked his client whether there was any restrictions or conditions on those. And Lynx uh, said that there was not and just gave him directions the day after he received it to transfer the money into their bank accounts. We can talk a bit about the different types or different ways a person can be found to be a trustee. Sure. Um, so the first one is obviously if you expressly agree to become a trustee. So the laws indicate that nobody can unilaterally name you as a trustee, you have to expressly agree, or otherwise there's other possibilities. In the context of this case, the court raised three other possibilities. The first is implied acceptance, which is when a trustee accepts their appointment by the conduct that they um, undertake. So for example, where they deal with trust property for reasons that cannot be clearly linked to another purpose, or where they exercise ownership or actively interfere in the affairs of a trust. 
The second possibility in this case was becoming a trustee de son tort. So in that case, that's if someone acts as if they have been appointed as trustee, for example, by exercising substantial legal control or possession of the trust property. And then the final possibility in this case was knowing assistance, which is when a third party to a trust will be held liable where they assist with knowledge in a dishonest or fraudulent plan on the part of the trustees. Right. Yes, that's very good. And I, th I think that the difference between implied acceptance is where a person just starts acting as if they are a trustee and this on tort, where a person just starts acting like they're a trustee. It depends on whether you were appointed or named by the individual. So in this case, um, the likely the possible route would be implied acceptance because Baker was named in the agreement as being the trustee, even though he didn't accept it. The question is whether he impliedly accepted it. Um, in the states, uh, in the estates context, we often see trustees to some tort is where a person is not appointed by anyone as the estate trustee, but they take that role on themselves. So that's the uh, a big difference between the two. Um, the court had looked at uh, acceptance by conduct and said that it's very fact specific. In this case, there was there was no acceptance, implied acceptance, because the uh, Mr. Baker, the lawyer, received the funds without any knowledge of any conditions on them. He received it uh, just as funds for his client, and there was no reason for him to make any inquiries. There's an, another case similar to this that uh, was decided. It was the Fogler decision. Um, that's referred to in the case where the law firm received monies. They knew that they were trust monies, but they didn't know the specific terms of the trust. Um, and the, they were held liable when they dispersed the funds to, contrary to the terms of the trust because they ought to have made inquiries as to what the conditions or terms of the trust were. In this case, the court felt that there was no reason for Mr. Baker to make further inquiries, having received these funds with no conditions or uh, any sort of uh, restrictions imposed upon him or terms. Just um, the what about the fact that he received these funds into his trust account? What uh, what was the effect of that? Did that make them trust funds? No. So the court concludes that a mere transfer of funds into the trust account of another party's lawyer without anything further is not sufficient to result in a finding that the lawyer was a transfer's trustee. So as you mentioned, he, he was never made aware of the agreement. He even asked his client whether there was any conditions to this money, um, and he said there weren't. Um, so he really had no indication that there was, that these would be held in trust, despite being transferred into his trust account. Right, okay, so that, that's an important factor as well. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad that the court didn't say that simply because you receive funds uh, in trust that that makes you a trustee. You have a, an, an obligation as to how you're to deal with those monies, but you would receive them as a, an agent. Often we receive money as an agent for our clients and have no obligations to anybody else other than our clients. Okay, we will put a, a link to this decision um, in our the blurb that goes out with this and on our website. Um, did you have any other comments or observations about this case? I thought it was a, a very well-reasoned and well-written decision. Yeah, I totally agreed with the reasoning. And I thought it was interesting that at the end of the decision, the court commented on how Mr. Baker's professional responsibilities as a lawyer were also not necessary. Like they're not, it wasn't a necessary element of the claim. And even though like inquiries may have been required by his professional standards, these on their own could not serve to impute knowledge of a trust on him. Um, so Mr. Baker, even though this is a BC decision, he practices in Ontario. So the court actually made reference to the rules of professional conduct in Ontario. Um, and it pointed out that under these rules, trust conditions must be communicated to all parties involved. So they're again repeating, like it can't be a unilateral, the trust can be, it cannot be unilaterally imposed on a party. Um, so I just thought that was also very important. Right, yeah, I agree. Another good line from the decision uh, I thought that I'm gonna use elsewhere if possible is that the court talked about the significant legal consequences of finding of a trust and the obligations on a trustee and then went on to say, the law therefore does not lightly bestow the title of trustee. So I think that, you know, the, the court will find a trustee in, in certain circumstances, but I think uh, it needs to be 
a clear communicated and ex clearly accepted either expressly or by implication. The court also concluded by saying that uh, the parties could have communicated more fully. If perhaps if Mr. Baker was given a copy of the trust agreement and told that he was to hold these funds um, in, uh, in accordance with the terms of the agreement and in trust and he expressly ex accepted that, then this problem could have been avoided. Just one other comment, I guess, is that the, the amount in question here was $30,000 US or $40,000 Canadian. It wasn't a, a significant amount, but it went through uh, motions for summary judgment and to the Court of Appeal, which is a mm -hmm. bit surprising for a matter of that size, but um, not surprising in light of the, uh, the, the, the court matters in issue and the uh, obligations of a lawyer and the suggestion that he breached, uh, breached terms of a trust. Definitely. No, I, it was a very important decision, I think, and I'm glad it made it this far. Well, um, thank you, Anita, and thank you for watching and listening, everyone. Um, if you have any comments, please uh, leave them on our website, or if you have any questions, uh, leave them there as well, or send us an email. Um, and until next time, I'm Paul Trudell. And I'm Juanita Valencia. Thank you for thank listening. You. Thank you. Goodbye.